Hello and evening everyone and thank you for taking time and the effort to come and join us here in Nottingham uh, to hear myself, Nick and Alex speak. My name is Matt Podesta, I'm a furniture designer and I run a company called Podesta. We specialise in creating high quality bespoke furniture, both fitted, freestanding, for private clients, architects, interior designers and developers. Push a button now. Uh, when I was about seven years old, I started a local school, and some evenings I watched in absolute fascination as some boys started going home with small pieces of furniture or objects they'd made in the woodwork shop. I was gripped. I couldn't understand why, but I was. So I soon enrolled on a weekly class with a certain Mr. Danbury, and I quickly learned how to use tools, cut wood, cut fingers, make basic joints, and then plaster it and varnish and proudly take it home to show my parents. And I think the first thing I made was a pipe rack. <laughs> <laughs> you would follow diagrams, and some months later, it would emerge looking something like the diagrams. I don't think a pipe rack would be on the curriculum these days. Uh, when I was a bit older, at 13, I went to senior school. Uh, that luckily focused on the whole person. Um, they were very much more interested in developing you as an individual. Um, and actively encouraged my passion for woodwork, which was a real relief because I wasn't much good at anything else. So here the workshop facilities were vastly improved, and I was allowed to go into the woodwork shops most afternoons and play away to my heart's content. I did design and technology O-level. Uh, sadly, no A-level was offered, so I satisfied myself with making speaker cabinets. We'd go to RS stores or online nowadays, buy all the components, and I'd make speakers for boys for their rooms, which they'd a friend of mine still got some, actually. Uh, boxes, uh, guitar bodies, because I play guitar, so it was quite nice to make guitar bodies. And I had a great sideline in making ashtrays. I could knock out three in an afternoon. Always the entrepreneur, I think. And anything else that I could sell. The key thing was trying to make enough pocket money when I was about 14. I think it was at this point that I realised that uh, I could make possible money and a future out of what I had here. So after school, I spent a few years working as a sailing instructor in the Mediterranean, a complete radical departure, and it was great fun. So I enrolled on a BTEC, uh, which was a two-year course, as a slightly mature student, and I studied art design, photography, fashion, fine art, painting, and 3D. And what that course did for me was completely reconfirm that it was three-dimensional design that interested me, whether it be sketching or making or anything like that. It was just, it was there inside me. Uh, so then I got a job at Leicester, a job, sorry, a place at Leicester Poly, which is now De Montfort, as you all know. And I did a BA honours in industrial design and manufacture of furniture. Uh, I have to admit, I took things fairly lightly at Leicester. <laughs> and uh, got out of there in 92 with a 2-1, which I was quite relieved to have got. Um, now, I expect a few of you here are possibly in that same position, six months or so to go, a point where you have to decide what you're going to do with your future. And I recall not being initially too phased by it. I was a bit blasé. I hadn't really given it too much thought. I thought I'd just walk into a job of some form or sort of start a small workshop. My real problem there is that I didn't have any real form of mentor or any knowledge of how to do it. My focus had all been about my degree show and not much else. So with no business plan or a real thought of what I was to do, I left Leicester for good. I had to go and live in London where I thought the streets would be paved in gold. <laughs> we shall see. Um, I had a friend of mine who was a photographer, a really good fashion still life photographer, who had a, uh, he had a studio in Soho, a very exciting place. And uh, it was here that I built a very small workshop, probably in around about, about this big. And I got a saw in there and a drill and a few other bits and bobs. And I started making anything I could for anybody, whether it be a little sign to go outside a shop or a bedhead, you name it, I was doing it. And I did a lot of work for his brother as well, who did graphic work for Channel 4. It was uh, very long hours and very little pay, but I was ecstatic to be in London and doing what I believed to be living the dream. Frustratingly, money was very short, so I started freelancing for Habitat, and Tom Dixon and anyone else who'd have me as a jobbing designer. In those days, we were still using pencils and rulers. God, that makes me sound ancient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 45. <laughs> I'm not that old. All right. All right. Uh, 
CAD was a dark art in those days and still very much in its infancy. I mean, it was, oh God, it was so boring. Um, <laughs> it's just a black screen with a white line. You have to type stuff into it. I mean, it drove you nuts. I mean, some people enjoyed it, but not me. But I was introduced uh, through a bit of networking to a guy called Luke Hughes. Now, Pauline knows Luke. Yes. And Luke was, I think, 35 at the time. He ran a design practice in Drury Lane. And he used to be a maker, but he basically specialised in making bespoke commissions for Oxford colleges, uh, ecclesiastical furniture for churches and cathedrals, and office furniture for city corporations. He offered me a position as a designer so long as I got myself trained in AutoCAD. So I went off to some dreadful college in Runnymede for two weeks and did a crash course, and uh, Luke gave me a position. Luke was and still is a complete inspiration to me. But he was the first person I ever met who truly inspired me. Um, he taught me how to be effective and professional. The hours were very, very long, and the work could be very complicated. However, the joy of seeing the fruits of your labour I found to be utterly intoxicating. I think it's at this point it was cemented in my mind that this was really what I wanted to do. It's worth noting also that the most of the designs that we did are still in production today. And it's always a pleasure to visit a building and see seating or tables that we designed 20 years ago. Still there, still standing, still working. A few scratches and things. But we also had a model making shop at the rear, and this kept my hand in as we made one to five models of everything. So we could actually look around it, because 3D modelling absolutely mm -hmm. hadn't happened by then. You couldn't do a, a computer drawing and look at it. So we'd make, we'd make models. Well, I can happily say <laughs> they're still all there on the shelf in the studios, which is kind of a nice feeling. Ten months later, the recession of the early 90s was still biting, and as times got tough, I was let go. Last man in, first man out. It's fair to say I was pretty upset and uh, rather angry. I could understand that this was, after all, business. It was my first sharp lesson. There wasn't enough work coming in. I found odd jobs, including painting Arsenal tube station at night shifts to keep going in January. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I knew of somebody else in London called Clive Howdle. So I walked into his uh, offices uh, in, New in Maribyrn. And Clive had a design studio downstairs and a small showroom upstairs. And he had kitchens and tables and chairs and all the things that he'd made and designed. And I loved his style. He not only designed furniture and wardrobes, but he did design kitchens, as I said. And I did six months of freelancing for him. And I learned two very important lessons. Firstly, I was never, ever going to get rich as a jobbing designer. Well, not if you're, unless you're the boss. Uh, but also that there was money in kitchens. Now, I've always been a bit snotty about kitchen designers. What did they know about furniture? They went, oh, I'm a furniture designer, you're a kitchen designer, you're just box shifting. Oh, no, 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 who knows that? But they were all, uh, they were just slick salespeople as far as I could see. However, it was also obvious that these guys were earning some pretty good money. I also had another dilemma, and that was I wanted to get married. I had this lovely girlfriend and decided that she was the one for me. Just one problem, that without a proper job, I couldn't ask her father's permission. <laughs> so we saw an advert for a sales diner for Smallbone, and I thought that, well, with, at least, with a proper job, then at least I could ask her to marry me. Luckily, I was accepted at Smallbone. And as the recession <laughs> eased and the company started to take off, so I asked my girlfriend to marry me, but I still had to sell my little Austin Healy to buy the engagement ring. She still wears it on her finger. <laughs> Spoke wheels, red. <laughs> 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 uh, I was trained at Smallbone for a few weeks, and then they gave me this just dreadful briefcase, some rulers, a pad. He knows, he knows. And then the son come running in from the sales office and said, oh, I've got a lead for you, got a lead for you. And he'd, he'd hand you this piece of paper and you go, oh, great, Wentworth or something. And you'd jump in your car or get on the train, fly down there, and you'd come up against this sort of huge McMansion style of place, you know, age 25, oh, my God. All brand spanking new money. And uh, you'd try and do a design for these people and then try and sell it to them. And in those days, it was 100% commission. There was no basic salary. And you had to pay them rent each month on your desk and telephone lines. So you were actually paying to work out the offices, but for them to give you leads. So not allowed to do this anymore. It's against the law, but there we go. Uh, I stayed with them for a year and a day. Uh, I didn't like it. I struggled with the politics, but I did learn a lot. 
I also had a decent income for the first time. So I went to work for a firm in Chiswick who promised me a lot, but it never really materialised. I did, however, learn a huge amount about selling. And that's something that's really, really important. We can all design, but it's no good if you can't sell it. After three years, I left to join Mark Wilkinson. Again, these, both these guys work for Mark Wilkinson. Mark Wilkinson specialised in making high-quality kitchens, library studies, bedrooms, freestanding cabinetry for their, from their shops in Wiltshire. Mark was an inspiration to me in every sense. Still is. He was a true creative, passionate about his work and with a strong sense of family. And for the first time in my life, professional life, I was, I was really, really happy. Uh, through Mark and his wife Cynthia, who's the MD of the company, I watched and learned what it takes to run a successful business. I also watched all of the mistakes and after three and a half years decided to strike out on my own. I personally felt it really was time for me to put all of my knowledge into practice. Uh, 2002, so there was, I was 30, uh, <coughs> 34. It took me 10 years to pluck up the courage to do it, which is quite a long time, but it, it took me personally that long. It was May 2002, the economy was okay and I was determined to succeed, especially as I had a wife to support and two children. I've now got three. Uh, I started my uh, business, it's called Matt Podesta Design. Uh, we started in a small office at the back of a local village hall. I didn't require somewhere smart, as I always met clients at their own house or on site. I had no desire to own or run a workshop, no. and the hassle doesn't well, the hassle <laughs> <doesn't> go with <laughs> it. Um, but more from Nick about that in a minute, <laughs> says Sophie. Uh, I felt the best way to do, the way forward for me, was to do what Luke Hughes did, uh, and that is act as a studio slash design practice and subcontract manufacturer. Uh, Luke coined the phrase back in the early 90s of virtual manufacturing uh, upon the demise of his own workshops. It was this appeal that, that this method appealed to me most. This way I could keep my overheads low, so if I didn't have a lot of work in that month, it didn't matter, I didn't have to pay a workshop, I could just pay my phone bill. What I could do was I could buy it for X and sell it for Y. And then I'd have my profit nestled in between, and I haven't changed that. I'd simply be marking up the trade price of the furniture. Obviously, you have to negotiate very carefully and heavily with workshops to get it at a good price to enable you to mark it up. But that's a completely different uh, story altogether. Uh, and then you can try and make some money on appliances, fitting, painting, stone. Uh, this is for kitchens, by the way, and anything else you can put money on top of. My problem, though, really started in the recession of 2007. I have to admit, up until that point, work had rolled in. I was competitive, I could undercut, and I could still offer a premium product. By this time I was working out of an old dairy on a farm, but it was really only dealing with the general public. And all of a sudden, it stopped. And I was, not, I was just looking into a big black hole, struggling to pay bills and not much on the horizon. And by 2009 I was really scared, and decided that it was really sink or swim time. We were a bit like BMW, I'm going to use very rough analogies here, Let's, but we'll just use BMW analogy. So very sort of middle market, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. This is a, it's a big, big marketplace. But in order to make money on our business structure, I decided that we have to be Aston Martin. I was also working with mass market design, so my, the general look of my business was very broad. And where I was working and living, it, it wasn't working for us. So we were sort of generally in the same bracket as Smallbone, Mark Wilkinson, Martin Moore... Molem and, and a few other you know, well-known big names. Uh, with the collapse of the housing market and bankers losing their jobs and the confidence gone, we saw the, mass, the market drastically reduce. And I just couldn't end up fighting on a daily basis to win business from some of these bigger companies. It, it just it wasn't happening. <coughs> so we uh, swallowed, and it was time to do a new business plan. So I employed a business advisor, somebody who could act as a mentor and pass their years of experience to me. He's still with me today. Nick, you do the same. It's uh, good advice. It seemed the only way forward for us was to do the following. That was to rebrand as Podesta, not Matt Podesta <coughs> Design, at the top of the market. Take on a PR company, who are still with me, to reposition Podesta as a premium brand. Design a new website to reflect our new positioning. Take on an assistant designer. Invest in decent photography. Produce a brochure aimed at top London interior designers and architects. During the next 12 months, Podesta was reborn as a company at the top of the market. We had vision and focus and drive. 
We now work primarily business to business, with architects, interior designers and developers, and some private clients. We do not believe in running fancy showrooms, as they are expensive and our work is entirely bespoke. It's made for each client and we start <coughs> with a blank piece of paper. Instead, we specialise in designing and building high-end bespoke cabinetry, fitted or freestanding, and for those who can afford it. For example, of a piece we just made for Decorex. It's actually easier for us, as everyone is professional. Therefore, we all tend to work in a similar fashion and part of a team. Now, by that I mean you're working with a high-end architect, you will also be working with a high-end interior designer who will have high-end trades, carpet guys, flooring guys, whatever. So you're all speaking a very similar language, which is better than I find working with the general public who've never done it before. So what advice can I pass on to you all today? Well, I think the primary piece would be to network, network, network. The more people you can talk to, and don't be scared about doing it, the more you will learn. I learned that you have to make at least 10 calls a week to possible new clients. Out of this, you might get one opportunity to sit down in front of someone and explain what you do. Your portfolio doesn't matter how small it is, all it's got to be is accurate, concise and professional. You've got to be open to all ideas, as you'll never know where it'll take you. If somebody says, can you build this, you don't say no. You say, leave it with me, I might know a man who can. You go out there, you make a phone call, come back, team up with someone else, get it done. You'll be amazed at what you can do if you have a good plan. Here are some do's and don'ts of a design-led business, and they're quite interesting. Number one is do dream, but dream with your eyes open. Do be clear about what kind of life you want to lead. Do take help when it's offered. That is absolutely paramount. Don't be too proud. Do cherish past clients. Do keep it local. Don't believe your own PR. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of good reasons for that. Uh, don't forget that quality sells, so keep the standards high. Don't try and do it all yourself. You need teams. Delegate. Don't think you are always the best to do a particular job. And what I mean is, there will always be somebody out there who can do it better than you and cheaper than you. Build it into the cost of the project. Get them on board. Your life will be so much easier. Don't trust the banks. Full stop. <laughs> Don't lose sight of the cash flow. Don't concentrate on turnover and forget about the margins. Don't be impatient. Remember, it takes a long, long time. Nearly there. There used to be an expression, if you are still in business after three years, then you'll succeed. I happen to think it's only part true, as all successful people I know in my industry seem to think that it takes at least ten years. Now, I know this seems like a long time, but in actual fact, all you're doing is fine-tuning your business plan. For instance, I was convinced at the start that I didn't want to work with developers. Why? Because they're going to stiff me. Because they are aggressive, they are going to not pay their last bills, and they're unpleasant. Well, if truth be known, I was really scared of them. But if the other reality is, if you are professional, provide the service, on time, on budget, they will be your best friend, and they will put you into the next job, and the next job, and the next job. A private client will buy once in 10 years, a professional will buy two or three times a year. That's a lot of business. Once I realised this, we changed track. This, in fact, is really the key to our success. I believe that Pedestra only needs 10 key clients. We can operate on myself, a project manager, designer, an assistant designer, an office administrator and a bookkeeper. And this is how we now operate. We've been going 12 years and it's now that we think we've just about found our way. If I asked the question, what keeps me going? My responses would be the need to look after my family and colleagues. Be a good boss. To continue to develop Pedestrian to a brand that is known for its quality and service. To make Pedestrian stand out as a unique and key design practice within its field. To have a quality of life and deal properly with the stresses work brings. It can be a bit stressful, trust me. To actually enjoy going to work and finding solutions to problems that others may have and giving them a, a result is one of the most satisfying things you can do. Giving somebody something that lights their face up is, is fantastic. And finally, to inspire and instill others this passion I have for all things beautiful in design. Whatever route 
you decide to go down, whether it be full-blown designer, a maker, a workshop manager, or a teacher, remember that you are incredibly lucky to have this passion. Savour it, as it will take you on some really great journeys. I've got a couple of slides. Here's a kitchen for an architect. Part of the kitchen again, a bit of a Scandi feel with the table and the bench. A very classic piece. You've got to understand arts, and, in this case it was the arts and crafts movement. So you get out there, get your books out, in, investigate it. This is an arts and crafts property in order to replicate something that was suitable for that, for that building. So even built chimney, everything in this case. Uh, we won Kitchen Designer of the Year for this kitchen, which is uh, a nice accolade. Um, 3D rendering. That's Studio Max. When the client doesn't understand 2D drawings, this is the only way forward, or what he does, but he'll show in a minute. Uh, another private client. The interesting thing about this one is the island is floating off the floor on a small steel pedestal. I've had two men standing on there. It doesn't wobble. But also, <laughs> all the veneers are book matched. It's quite a special piece. Libraries, studies, traditional furniture for country houses. Don't forget that we don't always do contemporary stuff. We can do very, very classical furniture as well. And you've got to be aware of all of that. Here you can just see the beautiful quality of handmade drawers and veneer work. And classic tables, again, really important. But if you consider how complicated it is to do those veneers on the top, you'll realise the skill and the quality of craftsmanship that's available to us in the UK. It's beautiful. I love designing tables. Chairs are a nightmare for me, but tables I love. Downstairs, Lou's, always a famous place. I got that there because that's my um, livery... That's my passport to the Freedom for the City oh, of yes. London. <laughs> Bathrooms again. <coughs> There's that table and bench in the workshops. I'm really proud of that piece, I don't know why. A uh, bit dated now, but a, a little coffee table. Library, um, sitting rooms. Our badge. Bathroom. And this is how we present our drawings. It's all done on AutoCAD. You can use Vectorworks. Um, but I'd suggest <coughs> you use either Vectorworks or AutoCAD. You know, it, ah, <laughs> Nick's making for this. I've got to make that. Make this next <laughs> month. Um, Vectorworks or AutoCAD are the two ones that all architects use. You can then import and share drawings. It's really, really important. Uh, again, you can see here the architect's drawings. We'll strip them, put our work onto it, send them back. Everyone's happy. Uh, it's a bar we made for a job in Barbados recently. And here's another kitchen going to some wealthy Russian type in Wentworth. There's a little picture of our workshop. Workshops can be really traditional, but they can be really contemporary. Um, it's one of the things I actually enjoy. It's me winning an award. <laughs> and I think this is the one expression that's kept me going. Thanks very much.